Bonjour tout le monde, je me présente, je suis euh, François Dodard de la société RS Components, euh, je suis responsable projet et je suis en, en charge donc de, euh, entre autres de la, la mise en place de solutions autour de, de la maintenance euh, connectée. Et donc euh, pour cette, euh, ce webinaire euh, dédié à l'IoT et l'environnement euh, du BIM, euh, je suis accompagné de, de Dave Lister et de Richard Place. Euh, donc ce sont euh, deux personnes euh, anglaises. Euh, toutefois, euh, les présentations, les supports seront en français. Donc si vous avez des questions, surtout n'hésitez pas euh, à nous les poser. Euh, Richard, Dave, if you could introduce yourself to to start, please. Certainly, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, bonjour. Um, I am Dave Lister. I'm uh, the CEO of a company called iConnect. We are um, Uh, IoT systems integrator, among other things. We are a systems integrator at heart, but we specialize in IoT and we develop products and software services around uh, IoT and deployment. So we have some expertise and we've been working with uh, our friends in RS Components in France now for for two or three years, uh, developing solutions, developing ideas and uh, working on go-to-market product solutions. And uh, we're pleased to be here today supporting those events Um, and hopefully um, giving you guys uh, an insight into what we do. Um, yeah, Richard? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Richard Police. I work for a company called Sitedesk. I'm the CTO, uh, and we're a company that produces a visualization tool for 3D models, uh, both models that originate in Revit and other sources like uh, 360 degree uh, photo, photo scans. Uh, and we are specializing these days in linking site desk to underlying systems where there is data related to the model and i'll explain a little bit more about that later but uh, that's me for now ok donc on, nous allons commencer la présentation uh, richard uh, dave please up to you mm. okay cool so um so here we go again i, I just wonder if um, if any of the If any of the attendees have, have attended any of the other ones, because if, if if they do, my apologies if you've seen some of this before. Um, so I, I'll go into this today. I'll, I'll give it my best. I'll, I'll try and speak um, slowly as well, so everyone hopefully can can keep up. Um, and uh, let's see what we can uh, what so we can do. So, okay, the topic for today's discussion and what I'm going to try and talk to you about is uh, we call it faster, safer, more efficient with IoT and, and 3D visualization. Um, and uh, You know, it, it is it is quite an important topic because it, it is entirely possible. You know, that IoT is is around driving efficiency and improvements and and monitoring and strengthening of asset health and, and all of this adds up to um, typically faster, safer, and more efficient um, with use of IoT. Um, before I go any further, excuse me if I appear to be glancing to the right all the time, but I'd like to point out at this juncture that I do have my slides in English over here. And, and obviously these are in French, so you'll have to excuse me, I'm not looking away. I'm just looking at what I'm supposed to be saying. Um, so as we move through the slides, um, we have obviously the categories here, which you're familiar with, and, and we'll try and work through these. And, and, and halfway through this, I'm going to introduce you to Richard and let him speak a little bit more about what those guys, uh, what guys goes to do. So let me start by talking to you a little bit about what we see as the iot problem um, because you know iot is a uh, is has become fashionable and it grows a lot at this moment in time and a lot of people are predicting the growth of iot as, as huge we have predictions uh, in the billions for the number of connected devices that should be coming to us over the course of the next few years. Um, I don't personally believe we're there yet. Um, I don't personally believe we'll hit the numbers we're talking about, but I do personally very much believe that there is some benefit to be had in improving the health of assets, whether they be people or products. And I believe there's a, a lot of benefit to be gained in improving the planet and the sustainability message around the use of energy and assets and the deployment of IoT to do it. But um, historically for us, we believe IoT had, a, had a problem, an inherent problem. As with many solutions in the built environment and in the automation space and in the industrial automation space, 
companies build a offer and a solution typically around a single protocol. And that happens usually to be a protocol that they're very familiar with. It's one that is good and reliable in their world and they understand it. So they build a product offering around it and they then grow sensors and connected devices and connectivity around one particular protocol. And the truth is there's a lot of global, very large manufacturers around the world who've been supplying automation products now for many years. And um, they've done very well with this. And, and we've sold these solutions ourselves in the past and we've been part of this problem that we've now created. But the truth is when it comes to IoT, being restricted to just one protocol is, is, is quite prohibitive in finding the best solution for you. And it's important that when you look at a potential proof of concept or a, um, a pilot scheme or, or even a rollout, that when you're looking for multiple sensing opportunities and multiple sensors, that you should have the freedom to procure the sensor that is best for solving the problem. That, that's, a, that's the reality of what the problem is. So this slide alludes to where the, the world got itself to in the world of IoT. And if I can explain a little bit more, um, the devices across the bottom, if you can see my mouse moving, I don't know whether you can in this, but anyway, it's all fairly clear. Um, we're showing, for example, temperature sensing, we're showing movement detection and people movement, and then we're showing fairly basic stuff like um, switch status, CO2 levels, temperature again, um, all stuff that's very relevant. And traditionally, you, you had two choices. You either bought everything from the same protocol and used the same range, in which case it could be compromised, or you bought multiple sensors using multiple different technologies. And the big problem with that was you then typically had to buy multiple gateways or captors, as I as I now refer them to, <laughs> for the purposes of, of, of the friend of my French colleagues. Um, and then you had multiple subscriptions, multiple cloud instances, and sharing that became very difficult to manage. And and when it came to sharing that information with an AI platform or a visualization platform, your integrator had to then cope with multiple different protocols to get into the cloud. Um, and we believe, and again, I'm happy to discuss this. We believe that 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 what we what we see in the world of IoT and in our day to day lives at this moment in time is the built environment and the automation environment is now has to be fully connected with the IT world and the cloud. And the two have never been well connected. And when all of the AI platforms and developments and digital twins and all the things that we talk about every day, when they started to request information from the field, from the products that we sell, um, they didn't speak an awful lot of languages. Uh, the cloud itself and most of the main providers in the cloud, they request their information to arrive on their doorstep using a protocol such as MQTT, for example, uh, which seems to be the most prevalent. But actually in the built environment, we were using protocols from the likes of AirNotion, from Zigbee, from Sigfox, from multiple different locations. So there had to be a translation piece. And the problem with IoT was you, you, you were restricted. So how did we solve that? So this is, this is the solution slide that I reference. And in our world, we created a software product called Mobius Flow. And what Mobius does in essence is it enables you to take multiple different protocols from multiple different providers and multiple different sensors to bring them into what we call a normalization layer. And by that, I mean, if you look at the solution as was on the previous slide, now you have typically three different protocols coming into my world, into Mobius, and all Mobius is doing is communicating them bi-directionally with a cloud instance. So we convert all of those NOcean and all those other protocols to MQTT, and we send it to whoever or wherever it needs to go in the cloud, and this can be multiples, and we make it bi-directional. So all of a sudden you have an opportunity now to choose in each instance the best sensor for the purposes of solving your problem. And once you've solved the problem, you can send the data to the cloud, the cloud makes some decisions, the cloud tells you your devices what it needs to do to correct that. And hopefully that becomes the most efficient way of maintaining your products and services. So how do we do that inside Mobius? There's a lot going on in Mobius and it would be a presentation in its own right for anybody that was interested and we're happy to do that obviously, but I'm gonna give you some ideas. Um, I, mentioned, I mentioned in the previous slide, I noted uh, main cloud providers like AWS, IBM, Google, Azure. We're all familiar with these names. Um, inside Mobius, for the purposes of control 
and, and edge-based processing, we used a product called Node-RED, which is a, a, an open source product. Everyone's familiar with Node-RED in this particular space. So we embedded Node-RED, then we created enhancements around it. That little screenshot that you can see there shows that in, in, in a very simple application, um, we can actually share all or any of the data at any given time with multiple locations. So if you happen to work in Azure for what you do, but your customer happens to work in um, Watson, you can share the same information with multiple different instances and all of that information. So we have control. And over on the left hand side of the screen, you start to see that what we then created are the tool sets that you need to work with the sensors that we sell. So we work in particular with a product called NOcean, which are energy harvesting devices. Um, the guys at RS are very familiar with these and they have some partners in the NOcean space, for example. But the thing is with a sensor, once the sensor is connected, it needs translating. It will send raw data from the sensor, but it then needs a translation layer and you need to be able to do something with the data. So we've created tool sets inside this Node-RED product embedded in our Mobius product that enables you to work with those sensors and to create algorithms and control. It may be as simple as counting. It may be an interaction with another protocol or another device. It, you're creating thresholds, alert levels, all of the things you need to do in an IoT application where you need edge-based control. They all now are available here inside this space that we encourage customers to work with themselves. So what you're starting to see here is that we're moving away slightly from the traditional systems integrator because in the old days we did very well out of selling products like this and then charging you every time you wanted to make a change and we don't think that was the way forward we didn't see that that was a sustainable message so we've tried very hard to create a product that once you enter into this world you and your team once trained and familiar with node red can make all of those changes yourselves and you therefore reduce your reliance on a long-term partnership with a systems integrator other than new projects where you need some help. So a great deal of flexibility. So there's a lot more in there, but that gives you some idea. And the reason I show you this slide here, for example, is it gives you some idea of the complexity of what we can do. So given the right application, for example, we can do lighting control, we can do heating control. You can actually use IoT devices and sensors and build quite complicated, complex control models. To the extent that we've actually built lighting control inside a project in the UK where we can do the complete lighting control for an entire hospital using the same tool that in simple terms could pass, could take one sensor and pass that information from A to B if required. So extremely flexible is what we're trying to give you here. Okay, cool. So. Um, the ecosystem of IT, and I've referred to an awful lot of this. So when I move on to this next slide, you'll start to see why I why I reference this. Um, again, IoT is made up of, um, and historically industry has been made up of a number of silos. I, I hope the word silo translates perfectly into French, but vertical markets that, that didn't really talk to each other. And IoT itself is still viewed to this day when you look at social media and media and following, something will appear to be very specific to an industry. But what I want to try and get everyone to understand is that actually there should be no demarcation between those industries uh, because each of the products and the protocols that we talk about can be used in multiple different industries and multiple different marketplaces. So we look at this IoT landscape very differently. We see no demarcation here, although we list seven different options, we see it as all being very similar. And we think that all of these things should be addressed in the same way. And what you see on the screen there, I reference the cloud instances that we can then connect with if required, but you'll start to introduce you to some of the devices that we use, the Captur, the gateway, um, but also in the industrial automation world, we work very closely with a company called Beckoff Automation. I myself am part of that organization as well. Um, and then we have connection devices, both ones that we've manufactured ourselves, which we'll come on to, but then also this new world of connectivity through um, partners like Aruba and Cisco for the capture of data. And we'll come on to those a little bit more as we move through the, through the presentation. Um, so the next few slides, I'm not gonna dwell on too much. I'm gonna hand over to Richard in a few minutes time, but what I'm trying to get you to understand here is um, by looking at different vertical marketplaces, uh, and different options, you'll start to see that the sensors and the protocols that we're using are very familiar. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, uh, a 
a smart factory. You'll see in this instance, we're using LoRaWAN. You're familiar with that. I know Sigfox, for example, is very prevalent in France. But also in a smart factory, we start to use protocols like Embus, for example, which is very relevant in the metering space for the monitoring of energy, et cetera. Um, and our job with the captor is to bring this information in and then we start to share information with partners that, again, are very familiar to RS, like my colleague from SiteDesk and companies like Mobility Works. This is where we share the information. So I'm not the AI. I'm the middle layer. I'm the one that takes the data, provides the sensors, normalizes the data, allows you to work with the data on the edge so that when the providers that do the AI and the clever stuff in the cloud, what they get is a very clean and managed data feed. That becomes very economical because we're not sending all of the data all of the time. You're completely in control of what you're sending across your uh, distribution medium. And if that distribution medium happened to be cellular, for example, where you're paying for data on a megabit basis, it's important that you're not sending it all. You need to be able to filter these things. Um, uh, again, it, in, environmental, environmental issues, again, LoRaWAN another product which is extremely useful in that particular space in long range, we work with that. And actually we now have a, um, a LoRaWAN version of the captor that you see in the middle. Um, and a little, I'll touch on that briefly now, the, 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 the captor you see, uh, the gateway, um, we do not manufacture that. That's a product manufactured for us, one that's readily available. It's an Intel based product, so it plays particularly well in all arenas around the world. Um, and into that, we then incorporate our own Mobius software, but it gives you this ability to have Wi-Fi, cellular, and if necessary, onboard protocols. Um, and finally, um, the, the, the sort of smart buildings, which we're all familiar with at this particular time. Um, again, you'll see that I'm starting to introduce additional protocols here. So NOcean is here, but we've done this with workplace occupancy. You can do this with Orowan, with Sigfox. But when we look at people counting and movement management, for example, we move into a world of Wi-Fi and all of these products then need to be in. So I guess now is probably um, now is probably as good a time as any to, to let Richard speak for, for a few minutes on, uh, on SiteDesk. Um, Richard hasn't got any specific slides, but, you know, we, we reference what these guys do and he can really like to elaborate to you a little bit about um, BIM and digital modeling and try and hopefully um, give you put, give you some useful information and some insights into that. So, Rich, do you want to do you want to chat for five? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted a few words about BIM and then I'll come on to how SiteDesk yeah, is working in that area. But uh, essentially, BIM, BIM has a lot of focus in the BIM world, seems to be on the 3D model. But uh, the origins of, of BIM were really to, to encourage a process of collaboration. Uh, and the whole, the, whole, the whole idea is that by having a 3D model or a, a picture, if you like, everyone can use that to collaborate along the process of both construction or building a facility and then managing it afterwards all the way along to possibly rebuilding it at the end or or, or actually um or demolishing it so so what um so what i'm trying to diffuse a lot of the time is people just focusing too much on the 3d model what what you're really trying to do is encourage the overall usage of that model and making it as effective as possible for organizations now what happens with a 3d model generally is it comes from uh, your designer um, it may be up to date it may not be um, and typically it would be in revit or autocad so what what happens then is that model needs to be associated with all the critical data that you need to underline your business processes uh, and that's that's what this whole ecosystem that Dave's been mentioning is, is is based on. Really, we're all individual companies seeking to work together to take these diverse data sources and make them as useful as possible for your business. Uh, and what SiteDesk represents is is a visual gateway, if you like, to that underlying data. So we specialise in allowing you to see the three D model, but also through that, that 3D model, you can access underlying systems such as uh, facilities management software, common data environments, IoT data sources, all the way up to, uh, to anything that specializes for your particular industry. We have some companies that, uh, that have very specialized monitoring systems, for example, in the utility industries, and we can allow them to access data through the 3D model. 
Uh, and the benefit of all of this is that everyone understands a 3D model. Not everyone understands the underlying system. And, it, and in essence, this mirrors exactly what Dave's been talking about. He's taking uh, systems that are diverse and giving you a generic way of interfacing with those and making it useful. We then take lots of systems and we make them very easy to access using the 3D model. So Sitedesk is essentially a visualization tool. That's what I always talk about it as a, a gateway visualization tool to complex underlying data systems. And we're not seeking to replace those underlying data systems. You will always need specialists who have to manage things uh, in their own way using their specialized data tools. But also in most organizations, you have other people who aren't specialists in using such complex tools, but they still want to discuss the building and areas that those tools impact on. So allowing them to see things just by looking at a 3D model uh, really, really brings, brings, brings everyone together and allows them access to all this data, just makes conversations far more, far more easy. Um, and what's, what this is increasingly called in the BIM world is a digital twin. So you have a 3D model and gives you access to all the data you need to manage that process. Um, so what, what is Sitedesk per se? It, it, we're a web-based tool. Uh, we run on PCs, phones, tablets, uh, across, obviously across the internet. And we show 3D models in an intuitive way. It's far more intuitive than if you were to use uh, some of the proprietary tools like Revit or AutoCAD. Uh, and we are quick as well. We're a very fast interface, so models load quickly and we can give access to them quickly. But then we have the capability of integrating with the underlying systems. So as I mentioned earlier, we can link with CAF FM systems, facility management systems, uh, IoT streams, uh, and we're also connecting to some building management systems in, in the UK as well. So that's ongoing. And, and the basic ethos of how we work is you walk around the building uh, and you can see any assets that have got problems because we can make assets flash if, for example, a fridge is overheated or we can flag a whole area as red flashing because work is going on in that area. So you, uh, you know that gives you a, an insight of whereabouts in your building space is being used or not used. So you can, Im you can improve your space usage. So, so we, we're essentially using underlying data from a lot of systems to give you a nice visual feedback on that. And we can also interact with those underlying data systems. So for example, I could, uh, if, we're, if we're developing a link at the moment with mobility work, so it would be possible to see an asset. I can be in a, in a warehouse, I can be right next to the asset, I can look that asset up in my 3D model and I can create a task for that particular item. Or if I'm an engineer, I can see the, the asset that I'm working on and I can close off the task on that, say I finish the work. Uh, and and, and this, this gives a lot of benefits to people. So it's uh, for most people who aren't specific users for the individual tools that we're getting access to, it gives them a common and simple to use interface. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's not a replacement, it's just an alternative, more intuitive interface to a lot of, of other tools. Um, and it, a lot of people are finding it gives them a real benefit to understanding what they have. You might have a facility, you might have lots of assets within that facility, but rarely do you have a real understanding of everything about them. And if you can walk around a 3D model and actually get to underlying data for those for those items, it gives you a real understanding of what you actually own and what you have to manage. Uh, and it allows you to streamline all of your maintenance, planned, predictive and, and indeed reactive maintenance can all be planned using the model. Uh, and it can even be used in Dave's world, you could use the 3D model to plan where you're going to put your sensors. So you could use it to that level. So as you go around putting your sensors in, you could flag them up on the model or vice versa. You could show where you want to put a, a sensor on the model and then an engineer would know where, exactly where to put it. Um, but I think the biggest use, uh, the biggest benefit we found with most clients is it allows you to visually cleanse your data. And by that, I mean, lots of companies have lots of data uh, relating to all their assets in lots of different tools. And it's very rare that that data is unified and consistent. So if you can link it all using a 3D model, then 
by clicking on that 3D model, you can tell where some assets may not even be documented or where, where some assets uh, need further documentation. And it makes sure that all your data on your assets is kept up to date. And that's very, very difficult to do unless you've got that unified view on all the data across all of your particular applications. And I guess a question a lot of people might say is, um, I don't actually have a 3D model. I'm not building anything new. I'm running lots of existing uh, sites and they were built 10 years, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. They don't have a model. But uh, SiteDesk has a facility to import lots of different ways of getting a 3D model. We can work with 2D models if you have floor plans, things like that. But we also have support for things like photogrammetry, where you take lots of photographs and merge them together into a, a 3D view. Uh, and point cloud scans, we can support that as well. And we're also uh, just finished work on a, uh, a partnership with a company called Matterport, who do 360 degree photography. So you go around your facilities, both outside and inside, you take 360 degree scans at key points, and then their software merges that into a 3D model. And we can take that 3D model and link that to any underlying system that, that uh, a customer would like. So you don't have to have a Revit model or an AutoCAD model. We can make use of quite a few different ways of getting very accurate and visually attractive ways of looking at your, your, your structures, facilities, and bringing that into into the uh, into the ecosystem and showing the data. So that's a, that's a very brief introduction to what SiteDesk does and, and trying to explain where it lives in the BIM world and what the benefits are. So I'm going to hand back to Dave. I will take questions afterwards. And obviously, if anyone's interested in how BIM can help them, then um, they can contact us through uh, through Francois and we'll, uh, we'll talk to them. So back to you, Dave. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, OK, so where did I get to? So so we, we spoke briefly on the subject of the um, the smart office. OK, and I, I've introduced you to the fact that, that that the best way to solve these problems is to is to is to use and not be afraid of using multiple protocols. So let me um, let me on the next slide. Let me um, unpack. Um, do you know, at some point in these couple of days, I'm going to start trying to read this in French just to give everyone a good laugh. Uh, but but now is probably not the t <laughs> now now is probably not the time. <laughs> So Francois, Francois is laughing. Uh, so I, I, I said the espace de déballage intelligent. Uh, how's that, Francois? Is that is that all right? How am I doing? Ah, uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Excellent. Okay. You progress. You progress. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. <All> right. <laughs> Apologies to everyone else. Apologies to everyone else. Okay, so so let me uh, let me do what we call. Let me unpack this a little bit and let me give you an understanding of what what I'm talking about here. So this is a, a very typical office application for us, and we do this a lot. And we'll come on to some use cases where you understand this. But but this is the kind of the architecture of what I'm talking about here. The under desk sensors themselves, which we've sold an awful lot of, um, we list three different options there. Um, which we have sold. And, and in some instances, we've sold two different protocols into two different applications with the same customer because the sensors work in, in very different ways. So we look at additional, um, uh, we look at under desk sensors, we could use, for example, workplace occupancy as a protocol themselves. Again, it's an 868 protocol, but it's very similar to our notion, but they use um, they use different coding uh, or LoRaWAN, for example. Um, and in terms of connection, then this comes through this multiple protocol connector, which is an IA Connect product, which we'll introduce you to. But then also at the same time here, we're using Wi-Fi. Um, and you'll see a little screenshot of what's going on here. This this screenshot is not any sort of head end that you would receive. This is this is effectively the head end purely for the occupancy sensor and a setup and commissioning tool. But that's an interesting point in its own right, because anybody who in that smart office who wants to start to change the settings, you shouldn't have to go to multiple different locations. So actually accessing this portal through a central vehicle is, is very much uh, is very much what's required. So once we've got that office, let, let, let's talk a little bit about how you physically create those connections and try and make some more sense of what I'm talking about here in terms of system architecture. So if I start on the right hand side, I've referenced IQRF and Ocean right the way through this. The little product that you see here to the right hand side is what we call a connector. And we produce that. Now, when you work with wireless protocols in particular, and again with wired, I guess, but wireless mainly, you need some sort of antenna. You need some sort of 
um, aerial, which gives and collects over a, over a given distance, depending on the protocol, it collects the data from the sensors. Uh, and it then shares the data with the control elements of the, of, the, of the mix. So in this instance, we manufacture that. That particular one is power over Ethernet. So very, very network friendly. Um, and it can take two antennas. So you could actually have NOcean and IQRF running on the same device, which is we come into this multiple protocol scenario that we mentioned earlier on. Um, the data from there is being shared in that instance over the network, hardwired network, customer network, so not a specific network. And the the uh, the capture, the gateway is sitting on the network and being viewed locally if required. But then obviously through the client network or through the Internet is being shared with the cloud platform with the potential for that to be used for, for, for other purposes. To the left hand side is option B. Now, we're still using the same uh, connector and antenna at a site level. We're still running the Mobius software, which is so which is, you know, which we rely on. The difference being is that we can now run the Mobius software in a container in the cloud. So and to that end in the cloud, we then remove the requirement for the captor and we can host that in a container and you can do all of the good things that you used to be able to do over here, but in a cloud based scenario. And then from there, you can then start to filter in connectivity through things like wireless access points, which we'll, uh, we'll come on to in, a, in, a, in, a, in another slide or this slide as it happens <laughs> so this is a this is quite a revelation really and this is something that's really quite new um in fact very new um but we've spent quite a lot of time working with um aruba and now also with cisco who may, who are the, the kind of the, the world leaders in the supply of wireless access points and networking and in conjunction with an ocean um, uh, who I've referred to again quite a lot, the wireless protocol energy harvesting guys, um, you can now purchase uh, an ocean plug-in USB stick. And if you have a compatible Aruba wireless access point, you plug that in and your AP becomes your collection vehicle for your ocean sensors. So to put that into context, um, I presented this morning and I gave out a figure. Uh, we did some research on projects that we had lost OK, and we've quoted many millions of pounds worth of projects in the last few years. And when we look at the ones that we've lost, typically more than 90 percent of the ones that we've lost, the prohibitive part of the equation was the cost of the infrastructure required to overlay the IoT. And that might sound like a big number, and it, and it is. But when you consider that when, when, when sensors require cabling, when they require power, when they require additional network connectivity, the cost of those things is multiples of the cost of the actual sensor. We have situations where the sensor and the connector itself is, is sub 100 euros and the cost of deployment is greater than three to 400 euros by the time you provide power and data and connectivity. Then that's why a lot of the projects and POCs and pilots don't go ahead because the cost of the infrastructure is so prohibitive. So. Two to three years ago, we, we started talking to network hardware manufacturers to say, if you have the infrastructure in the building already, or you're putting the infrastructure into your new building, wouldn't it be good if we could utilize that infrastructure? And finally, that is now a reality. So working with Aruba primarily, um, this is now an option. So if you were looking to use any of the N-Ocean sensors for, for, let's say, temperature, humidity, CO2, presence detection, the list goes on. And, and, and Francois can help you at any time with, uh, with N-Ocean sensors. But you now have this ability. If you have the compatible and the right APs, we can really do this really quick, really easy and super efficient. And we take away a complete layer of, uh, of connectivity. So I think I think this is the future. What will happen in the future, hopefully, is when the consultants and the construction companies and the mechanical electrical deployment companies, when they start to trust this solution, you will find you can now do lighting control and building control utilizing the AP network and that single network infrastructure, which is a game changer because then the cost of deployment will plummet and the cost of buildings will plummet and the effects on the amount of copper used and the green credentials that will be provided by utilizing this single network, I think will really be uh, the next big thing. So watch this space for that one, but available now, it works, we're selling it. 
we can even start to talk about demonstrations and, and POC kits if you want to talk to uh, if you want to talk to Francois at some point we'd be happy to have that conversation so system architecture um, there's a couple of slides on this but they are slightly different but I think it's important that we um, that we start to think about this because we start to introduce things like uh, in our world we spend probably now 50% of our time talking about industrial IOT and, and Francois and the guys at RS I know that they, they're very involved in that space with their customers and when we look at industrials we start talking about things like we move away from simple things like um, temperature humidity CO2 and we start to move into things like motors and motor monitoring and motor health monitoring and asset health monitoring and plant monitoring um, and it's important that we factor those in so again as part of our gateway as part of our solution um, we have looked to integrate we have a huge integration list of protocols that are very prevalent in that industrial space um, they, for some reason they've, they've dropped off the presentation on the earlier one but to, to, to put you in the picture we're very comfortable with languages such as OPC UA with Modbus with BACnet and, and very much industrial protocols and built environment protocols we can translate those and we can communicate in the same way that we would do with NOcean or IQRF hence the reason we can start to look at things like vibration and temperature monitoring and we've done some trials with RS components here in the UK where I think we looked at 50 over 50 motors in one of their distribution centers for example monitoring temperature humidity or sorry temperature and vibration analysis on uh, on motors for predictive analytics so we've done quite a lot of work there and we've, we've done some some good stuff in Beauvais as well monitoring plant and monitoring asset life and health which again I'm sure that if you want to see some stuff working Francois I'd be happy to have the conversation with you guys around some of the demo material and some of the stuff that we've got running in our own sites um, but it's important to see that in the middle of this we have this intelligent virtual gateway in the center of the screen um, and this is the cloud-based container that I spoke about um, and then from that container we're sharing the information with an AI or an analytics package and that's not us that would be someone like Richard for example in SiteDesk um, but it equally it could be IBM's Maximo product for enterprise asset management if that's who you deal with or any of those others in uh, in some of those instances so we, we can share that information with whoever needs it we can also bring in third-party data and I think that becomes apparent in one of the um, uh, one of the use cases which I'll show you shortly uh, which you'll see um, so, so really, really, really flexible architecture that we can bring together here and, and make sure you've got this single point of contact for the cloud and, and the cloud loves a single point of, uh, of contact. So here we go. So, so just a couple of user cases to bring this to an end today. Um, but I think they're really important and I think they, they'll really help you. Um, very much uh, a repetition of, of where this previous slide came from, but this is an actual real life application. So we, we, we completed the works um, early in 2020. Um, in a university in Canada, uh, we deployed uh, 86 um, optical people counting devices and the screenshot in the top right hand corner shows the output of those devices and the, the little lines that you see on there um, are flexible, they dictate what you're looking for. So uh, am I looking for people coming from the left? Am I looking for people coming from the right? For example, am I looking at people opening doors and you can start to be quite prescriptive with those devices. But those devices were Wi-Fi, power over Ethernet, and on the client's network. So the client created a VPN, uh, sorry, yeah, the, the, client, the client created a VPN. Um, we put those devices on there, and we brought the information back into our Mobius platform. 86 of those devices deployed around the college. But then while we were there doing the installation, they had a customer, uh, they had another uh, supplier putting in RFID readers in washrooms to monitor the health of the washroom and the cleaning facilities. And they also put sensors around the building for um, bin level sensing. And the client we were working for really only, only wanted one feed into their dashboard. So we very quickly integrated by the use of an API, we integrated the waste bin cloud sensor platform and the washroom RFID readers into our Mobius platform which meant we could then aggregate their data as well as our data and the client only gets one clean feed. So at the top of the screen, you'll see the single line going to the cloud and dashboard. 
it was a product called ThingsBoard in that instance, but it had been developed by the provider themselves as their own their own tools. Um, but at the same time, the evolution of this Canadian project is they're implementing an enterprise asset management system, and we can now share all of the data from those 86 sensors plus the RFID and the BIN sensors with the enterprise asset management system at the same time. So I think a really good example of, of how it can be done very well. Um, and I think finally, we, we, we reference this site quite regularly. This was a, a, a building in London just off the edge of the Thames. Um, and again, uh, pre-COVID, uh, back in January, uh, December and January last year, uh, we installed 3,500 under-desk sensors. And in that particular instance, we used protocols from both NOcean uh, and from workplace occupancy. Um, now, admittedly, the minute we finished it, they all went home and nobody's been there for a year, but we've still got three and a half thousand under-desk sensors fitted uh, waiting for this. And in that instance, Every single one of those sensors across 28 floors and 96 antennas is connected to our Mobius product in the cloud where we normalize the data and we share it with the digital twin provider. Um, in, that com in, in that instance, it was a company called iOffice and they specialize in giving the customer the ability to model the usage of their assets and their people in based on real-time data. Um, now, we show an air quality meter on there because at this moment in time, we're talking to the client. They have they have a, they know very soon people will start to come back to the office. And one of the things they're looking for is a monitoring um, CO2 levels and uh, particulate matter. And the um, the air quality sensor you see on the screen is one that we manufacture ourselves and we sell that through RS. And um, because of the infrastructure they put in already, if they add these sensors to the building, there is no extra infrastructure. They just buy the sensors and the sensors connect directly to the antennas that we've already uh, that we've already installed. So, you know, a big project. It was a 200,000 euro plus project from our point of view, which was great. Um, and I think probably to close, um, my message here is when you deal with us on your IoT project, you're dealing with people that are not just talking about it. We are actually doing it. We, as a business um, across the world last year, we did, I guess, in excess of 1.5 million euros in IoT projects alone. And that's quite unique at this moment in time. There's a lot of talk. There's a lot of huge project estimates, but very few people are actually delivering it and, and doing it. And, and you can... Uh, you can rest assured when you talk to us, you know that you're dealing with people who, who can take these products to scale. Um, and on that note, that is my last red slide. Uh, and I think at that point, uh, Francois, if I can thank everyone from my point of view for sitting and listening to me for so long. And uh, I'm glad you're still here. And uh, I'll hand you back to Francois. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, Richard. Uh, on, on, on fait en fait, ce qui est vraiment important de, de voir, c'est la, 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 les, les capacités, les, toutes les possibilités qu'offrent euh, les, les capteurs euh, IoT euh, et surtout l'intégration des capteurs IoT dans un environnement euh, BIM, donc dans un environnement en 3D. Donc, euh, on a la possibilité de, euh, de modéliser euh, toute votre infrastructure, euh, que ça peut être un bâtiment, ça peut être un, euh, une unité de production, euh, ça peut en fait tout, tout, tout ce qu'on tout ce qu'on veut et de le modéliser donc en 3D en positionnant tous les capteurs IoT. Ce qui vous permet en fait d'avoir cette euh, avec cette visualisation euh, bah, donc de, de pouvoir voir immédiatement et surtout si elle est présente dans la GMAO Mobility Work comme on a pu le voir euh, euh, ce matin dans une autre dans une autre session euh, d'avoir en fait le, le positionnement et là où il y a des alertes. Et euh, ce qui vous permet un d'être beaucoup plus réactif, deux, il y a aussi un côté sécurité euh, des employés euh, afin de et surtout pour les techniciens de maintenance ou les agents de maintenance afin que d'éviter qu'ils se puissent se retrouver dans des zones euh, dangereuses ou difficiles d'accès euh, bah, le fait d'avoir cette combinaison entre l'environnement BIM donc en 3D et euh, le positionnement de tous les capteurs IoT et avec les, les, la présentation de, de Dave vous avez pu voir que euh, 
bah, au niveau des possibilités euh, de capteur, ça touche tous les domaines, que ce soit le, les capteurs de courant, de température, de vibration, de pression, les capteurs acoustiques aussi, comme on a pu le voir hier avec euh, Vavli. Euh, on a pu voir aussi des, des capteurs de, euh, de qualité d'air, euh, comme ça, Dave vient de, de le présenter. Euh, il y a des capteurs de présentiel, donc effectivement ce, ce type d'information euh, et surtout je dirais, malheureusement dans le contexte actuel avec la, la Covid-19, euh, il est important qu'on puisse visualiser immédiatement si l'air est nocif, euh, si euh, alors le capteur de présentiel, c'est pas pour voir si les gens sont mis au bureau, c'est surtout pour s'assurer que est-ce qu'il n'y a pas trop d'environnement dédié et surtout par rapport à la distanciation sociale euh, et tout en fait tous ces capteurs peuvent vous permettre de générer des alertes et, euh, et la combinaison encore une fois avec cette cette visualisation en 3D telle que Richard a pu vous vous le présenter euh, ou en parler euh, ben vous permet d'optimiser euh, toute toute cette infrastructure euh, et donc vous rentrez dans une logique de RSE euh, mais aussi parce que euh, cela va générer des réductions de coûts euh, au niveau euh, des coûts énergétiques, euh, ça peut générer des réductions au niveau de l'impact carbone et, euh, et de ce fait vous rentrez aussi dans une logique euh, de TCO. Donc euh, c'est euh, des notions euh, et c'est un ensemble de solutions, c'est un écosystème. Hein. Euh, on a pu voir durant, cette, durant ces trois jours, euh, ben, avec les, durant les différents webinaires, il y a la partie IoT, il y a le BIM, il y a la GMAO, euh, il y a les armoires connectées. Euh, cet ensemble en fait offre un, un panel de solutions connectées euh, qui vont vous permettre de générer euh, des, des réductions de coûts de façon significative. Et là, par le, via ce qu'on vient de voir là, cet après-midi, euh, d'assurer euh, la protection de vos, de vos collaborateurs. Euh, c'est ça que je voulais vraiment, euh, voilà, vraiment mettre en avant et c'est ce, ce, ce sur quoi Richard et Dave se sont, euh, se sont focalisés. Euh, Est-ce que vous avez des questions euh, par rapport à ce qu'on vient de vous présenter est-ce que vous avez besoin de précision euh, sur certains points Du coup, si vous avez des questions après coup, n'hésitez pas euh, à nous recontacter. Euh, on tâchera bien évidemment euh, d'y répondre. Bah, écoutez, je vous remercie beaucoup. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much, Richard, for your, for your support during yeah. this presentation. Uh, I think that we, we can now close this, uh, this webinar. Merci beaucoup. Merci tout le monde. Euh, à très bientôt, passez un bon week-end et prenez soin de vous. Merci yeah. beaucoup, bonne journée. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Yeah. Bye. 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 Cheers, bye bye. Bye.